For those of you doing this yourself, keep in mind that our process has been refined for years and years and our system is extremely streamlined. So if it's taking you much longer than it's taking us in this video, you should have seen us doing it 20 years ago. An issue that we've run into on almost every job site is that we do things a little bit strangely when it comes to a timber frame with a SIP enclosure in that after the timber frame is up, the first thing we do is hang gypsum and that is completely opposite to typical construction. So usually the gypsum doesn't get installed until the house has a roof on it. Uh, but when we're installing SIPs on the outside of the timber frame, we want to get the gypsum in between the SIP and the timber frame so that the posts can expand and contract seasonally without opening up any gaps. So we don't want to have a butt joint between the gypsum and the post. The way to avoid that is to run it continuously on the outside of the timber frame. We've had some fun with the uh, lumber delivery company. We're out here on an island, obviously don't have a lot of choices. Um, turns out that they only do deliveries on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Today's Tuesday and we really needed the delivery. Um, they were really flexible and they actually sent over the framing lumber that we needed to assemble the SIPs in one truck. Then they sent a second truck that had all the windows and doors in it. And we really didn't want the windows and doors on site yet. Things are still a little bit congested outside with the SIPs spread out all over the place. So they were willing to take that truck back to the lumber yard and park it and in turn load the gypsum, which is what we really needed. What happened this morning is that the lumber yard sort of believed that that order of gypsum was in error. And so they were hesitant to bring gypsum over until they made contact with us and confirmed that we did in fact want the gypsum delivered to a wide open structure. And we've run into that many times where the, the lumber yard uh, sometimes thinks that they're doing us a favor by postponing the gypsum delivery when in fact we really need it very early in the construction process. So one of the unique things that we do uh, when we're wrapping the timber frame with gypsum is use a type MR, which is a moisture resistant drywall. It's typically used underneath plaster. So if you know that you're gonna be installing uh, plaster interior, you might consider using this MR. It has a resin in it that keeps the gypsum actually bonded together even when it's wet. Now, when it's wet, it gets very weak and it's not a good idea to try and work with it, to try and install screws and so on, but it can become totally saturated without flowing the way a non-MR gypsum would when it gets wet. We use the type MR because we can't control the weather and there is always some amount of open time. It might be a day, it might be three days when we're closing one of these before we get the roof panels on and before we get the underlayment on the roof when it essentially becomes watertight. We always encourage our customers to visit the job site, even to come to the shop when we're cutting their timber frame because we think it's such a neat experience to, to witness. The reality is that every one of the timbers that goes into this building is touched and worked by hand by our crew working in the shop. So we like to get them involved. It makes them a little bit more appreciative of the labor that goes into creating a timber frame. Today we were lucky enough that our customer Frances took the day off from work and she came out to the job site and it was fantastic. She was all smiles walking around. We got to talk a little bit about some of the details. She opted to have curved braces. There is a little bit of an upcharge for that and she's thrilled that she did it. Very happy with the appearance of uh, the braces. And she's also very happy with the, um, the ceiling. There was a little bit of back and forth on whether she wanted a gypsum ceiling inside the timber frame or a plank ceiling. We ended up going the plank ceiling. Luckily, she's very happy. So again, we broke into two different crews. We had one crew working on panel prep. Rather than swinging one four foot wide sip into place and attaching it to the timber frame, we like to build assemblies on the ground. So we do as much as we can. So we basically built 12 foot wide sections of wall on the ground, which consists of three sips put together. It's a little less wear and tear on the crane and it's a lot less wear and tear on the installers because much of the work that we do in detailing the sips can be done on the ground rather than uh, standing on a ladder. A typical detail um, of joining the panels together, whether it's wall panels or roof panels, is a two-fold connection. So one of the critical connections is the connection of the SIP to the timber frame, and the other is the connection of the SIP to itself, because we do want a continuous shear uh, wall or shear diaphragm on the outside of the building. So typically, uh, we'll use very long screws that run all the way through the panel from the exterior. They have a pancake head. Um, so they grab a lot of OSB and pull it tight to the timber frame. The connection detail from panel to panel is via a spline. So just behind the exterior OSB on the SIP, there's a groove cut in the foam and that's cut 
half into the right hand panel and half into the left hand panel. Uh, the spline fills that groove and then we run screws through the exterior face of the SIP into the spline and that joins the two skins together. One of the most critical parts of a, a successful panel installation is filling all of the voids between the panels with foam. We don't want any warm, moist air from inside the building leaking out into the panel assembly where it can reach the dew point and go from a vapor to a liquid. And the way we avoid that is to make sure that the panels are completely air sealed and we do that with the expanding foam. So while the panels are on the ground, we like to drill holes through the exterior OSB uh, so that once the panel is up in place, very clear where that expanding foam goes. We go into much more detail about SIP panels and exactly how we install them in our Building with SIPs online course, which you can check out at the link below this video. The last thing we have to do to the walls is attach the water resistant barrier and we're using a product called HydroGap which has little dimples on it that makes the siding actually stand away from the OSB. So if any water gets behind the siding, it has a little bit of a drainage plane. So sometimes we get asked if it's really worth segmenting the water resistant barrier and installing it onto the sections of panels that are only 12 feet wide. Typically, when you stick build a house, you frame the entire house, sheathe the entire house, and then walk your way around with the WRB so you only end up with horizontal seams, which are inevitable. We do like to put the WRB onto the individual wall sections on the ground, even though it will mean that we have a vertical seam about every 12 feet for a couple of reasons. One is we find we have much better quality control when we're installing the WRB on the ground. It's much easier, it's safer for the guys. We're not working on ladders and we're not setting up staging all the way around the building to be able to do it. And the reality is that we have excellent tapes available today to take care of those vertical seams. And since they are in fact truly vertical, they're fairly easy to make watertight behind the siding. This afternoon, we're going to try another new tool, which is a fully automatic staple gun. So in the past, when we're installing the uh, water resistant barrier, we usually use a slap stapler. So it's a lot of uh, hand action. This little staple gun is pneumatic and it shoots staples just as fast as you can move it across the water resistant barrier. So we're hoping that might speed up the process. You do end up installing a lot of staples. One crew will work on that and another crew is going to work on uh, finishing off the gypsum. Again, we're sort of hoping that we arrive at a completion point at about the same time and then we can start swinging the panels in. On this job, we have a fairly large crew because we are doing <coughs> a more in-depth build than we typically do. And we're able to break up into different teams. So we will usually have a team leader, Gabe, or team leader, Ethan, sort of managing each of the different processes as we go. And of course, you need more than just the team leader. This week, this, this team is working phenomenally well together. It's amazing to me how much we've gotten done in two days. So I'm very impressed and excited about what the rest of the week has to hold. Today we had some passing showers, basically the type where the ground got wet and you had a little bit of water dripping off your hard hat, so not torrential downpours, but it was raining a bit. And we basically just worked through it. It wasn't really an issue in terms of gypsum getting wet or the crew getting too wet to work and so on. Again, we've got a sill plate that runs around the perimeter of the building and that sill plate extends out beyond the timber frame uh, by the panel thickness. So in this case, that's seven inches. So as we pick a section of panel up, we'll swing it against the timber frame and lower it onto the sill plate. On top of the sill plate is a shoe and the panel sits over that shoe and then we can mechanically fasten the sip into that shoe. That completes the connection down at the base. That's ultimately what ties the timber frame to the foundation. But the load path is through the SIP screw. So once we have the SIP installed on the shoe, we chase that up and drive proprietary SIP screw through the SIP and into the timber frame. And that's what locks the timber frame down to the foundation. So again, in the, in the interest of doing everything we can on the ground, before we lift a section of panel, all of those SIP screws will be installed in that section. So when it's in place in the building, we send someone up on a ladder, but all they're doing is carrying their drill and setting those screws. Notice that in order for us to pick up the panels with the crane, we have to damage the WRB with the meat hooks. It's not a big deal. After the panel's in place, we go back, we fill that hole with expanding foam, and then we also put a waterproofing tape to return the integrity of the WRB. So at the end of the day, uh, as you walk around the building, if you're not familiar with uh, SIP installation on a timber frame, you might think that we've done a terrible job because all around the building at the corners and at the top of the wall, there are gaps. 
And we actually do that on purpose. We, we request from the panel manufacturer pre-cut panels that are approximately a half an inch um, short, both in height and width. That way when the panels go together, uh, we can screw them to the timber frame and we have a gap that we can look into and we then fill that exposed gap with expanding foam to make sure that we get a good airtight seal um, at the corners and we also do the same detail at the top of the wall uh, where the roof will overlap the wall panel. If the pieces are tight when you install them it's virtually impossible to get expanding foam in there and a wood to wood joint is far from airtight so we pull the two pieces apart and that allows us to look into the void and fill it fully with expanding foam. The other reason we do that is a little bit more uh, critical, which is that these posts and, and beams, the rafter plate and the posts, for instance, are green, so they're going to shrink. If we had a tight seam between the roof panel and the top of the wall panel and the rafter plate shrunk an eighth to three sixteenths of an inch, the wall panel will actually start to push the roof panel off of the timber frame because the SIPs are inert, they're an engineered panel, so they don't shrink the way the timber frame does. So at all wall-to-wall -wall intersections and wall-to-roof intersections, we like to leave a gap that we fill with expanding foam. That expanding foam will compress as the timber frame shrinks and in fact makes the joint a little bit tighter. The ground crew started stitching together the water-resistant barrier, so our typical panel width is about 12 feet wide so the WRB is about 12 feet and then at each edge of the panel we roll it back so that when the panels go together on the building the seam is fully exposed so we can get to that seam and do the detailing we need to do. So the ground crew was starting to finish that detailing and unroll the WRB and overlap it um, on itself, get it stapled in place. All right, it's the end of day two and we've had a phenomenal day. Despite some rain showers and some very ominous thunder, we managed to hang the rest of the gypsum and get all of the water resistant barrier installed on the wall sections on the ground and get all of the walls installed on the building. So it's really phenomenal day. Kudos to the crew today. They really hustled to get it done. So surprisingly, tomorrow's a big day. We say that about every day. Our goal for tomorrow is to get all of the tongue and groove installed on the roof and swing all of the roof panels. Uh, gonna be another marathon, kinda like today. Hey guys, here at the Shelter Institute, we've been teaching people to design and build their homes since 1974, and we've been building timber frames for about 40 years. We design and build timber frames, we sell fine woodworking tools, we teach house building classes of many different types. If you'd like to learn more about what we do, check us out in person here at our store in Woolwich, Maine, or online at shelterinstitute.com.